So welcome to my talk. My slides are already uploaded on the speaking tab of fastwonderblog.com if you want to follow along or grab the links that are sprinkled throughout the presentation. And we should have almost 10 minutes at the end for questions. So drop your questions into the questions tab and I'll answer a few live before we move into the breakout room. Today, I'm going to talk about a few topics related to governance, starting with a look at the differences between projects that are under foundations compared to projects that are run out of individual companies. After that, I'll talk about how governance is mostly about the roles and processes that guide how people collaborate and make decisions, including some thoughts on how to document all of this in ways that set your project up, project up for success. Then I'll wrap it up with a few final thoughts and links to hopefully some useful resources. First, I'll tell you a bit about me. I've been in the technology industry for over 20 years, working mostly on open source projects from within companies like Puppet and Intel, where interestingly enough, I worked with Denise, our last presenter. At Pivotal, I was responsible for driving our Kubernetes contribution strategy. So that's kind of how I got involved in the Kubernetes contributor experience special interest group. Now that I'm working in VMware's open source program office and I'm responsible for our open source community strategy, lately I've been more active in the CNCF contributor strategy SIG, in particular the governance working group. I'm also on the steering committee for the Linux Foundation's to-do group where companies collaborate on ways to run successful open source program offices. I'm also a board member of Open UK, which is focused on developing and sustaining leadership in open technology within the UK. And I'm a governing board member and maintainer for the Linux Foundation's Chaos Project, which is focused on using metrics to evaluate the health of open source projects. I also have a PhD from the University of Greenwich here in London, where I was researching how people working at many different companies collaborate together within the Linux kernel. Now, I wanted to start by talking about why it's so important to think about who owns or controls an open source project, because it's something that many of us don't spend as much time thinking about as we should. Projects that are controlled by foundations and ones that are owned by an individual company can have very different dynamics and risks associated with participating in those projects. It is not always clear whether a foundation is neutral or not. I generally start by looking at the leadership for the foundation. If the board of directors or other leadership bodies are made up of people who work at a wide range of companies, especially if they're competing companies, that's a good indication that it's a neutral foundation with a good balance of people to represent various aspects within the industry. If the board members, on the other hand, are primarily made up of people from a single company or maybe just a couple of companies that have very close ties together, it's also not likely to be a neutral foundation. Trademarks are another thing to look at. In a neutral foundation, the foundation should own the trademarks associated with, for example, the name of the foundation and probably most of the projects. If the trademarks are owned by a company, especially a single company across the whole foundation, that's a red flag that the foundation is probably not neutral. It can also help to look at the projects under that foundation. Were they originated at a single company or did they come from a wide variety of different companies? Do those projects have leaders from a variety of companies? Do they have contributor license agreements from one company or is the CLA from the foundation? The more you see references to a single company across the projects, the less likely it is to be neutral. And these are just a few of the many things that you can look at when you're trying to decide if a foundation is neutral. The Apache Software Foundation, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the CNCF, Eclipse, and the Linux Foundation, those are all neutral foundations. On the flip side, the Open Usage Commons Foundation is not one that I would classify as a neutral foundation. The success of Kubernetes can be attributed in part to being contributed to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Putting Kubernetes into a neutral foundation with representation from a bunch of different companies provided a level playing field where each of us could collaborate and innovate as equals to create something that benefits the whole ecosystem. 
With neutral foundations, our end users get access to more innovation from a diverse group of contributors, while also reducing vendor lock-in. For example, users of Kubernetes can consume enterprise versions from a wide variety of vendors that can run on any of the leading cloud providers, or they can roll their own solution using open source Kubernetes. And as software vendors, we can contribute to foundation-driven projects with the confidence that no one company is in control of the project and that we can contribute as equals within the community regardless of who we work for. Open source projects that are controlled by a single company are higher risk because they operate at the whims of that company. Whereas projects that are under neutral foundations have a lower risk, both for end users and software vendors. When a project is owned by a company, there's little recourse for outside contributors when that company decides to go in a direction that doesn't align with the needs or expectations of the other participants within the community. When a project is owned or controlled by a company, consider the reputation of that company as a steward of open source projects. But always keep in mind that they can change their strategy at some later date. We've seen some of this with Google around the Istio and Knative projects. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't participate in projects that are owned by other companies, but we should think about the risks that we're taking. In some cases, it makes a lot of sense to accept this higher risk, but we should at least try to make sure that we understand the risks that we're taking. At VMware, for example, we believe that contributing open source projects to neutral foundations is important. And it's something that we do regularly for projects that we've started once they start to gain a bit of traction with people outside of the company. For example, we've contributed Harbor and Contour to the CNCF. We contributed Turn to the Linux Foundation's automated compliance tooling project. We've also contributed projects to the Apache Software Foundation and other foundations. The challenge with contributing open source projects to foundations is that you also give up some of your control to the foundation. Typically, assets like the project's trademark, repositories, websites, and other things would be transferred to the foundation. Existing maintainers and leaders will usually keep their positions. However, neutral foundations usually make sure that governance is set up in a way that makes it easy for people from other companies to participate and eventually move into leadership positions. So as the contributing company, you should expect more leadership transitions over the longer term, which is um, perfectly healthy. And while this does mean giving up some control over the project, there are a lot of benefits with advantages around community building, innovation, and wider adoption. It's something that we should at least consider for our open source projects. It's also important to think about when your project might be ready to contribute to a neutral foundation. If your project is very immature and just getting started, foundations are less likely to be interested in your project. Whereas a project with a bunch of users that's starting to get really good traction within the industry that just maybe needs some help moving up to the next level is going to be a lot more likely to be accepted by a foundation. And how, however, companies should understand that contributing a project to a foundation is an ongoing commitment. It is not an exit strategy. And you need to be prepared to provide staff and other support over the long term and the short term, just like you would if you weren't contributing it to a foundation. We've been doing quite a bit of work within the CNCF Contributor Strategy SIG in the Governance Working Group to help document some governance best practices. And this section contains ideas, inspiration, and materials that I've been working on along with other people like Josh Burkus, for example, within the working group. So a lot of people really like to hate on governance. It's just extra paperwork, it's busy work, it's politics that get in the way of doing the real work on the project. The reality is governance can be found in all open source projects in one form or another to specify the processes for how people work together within the project. Ideally, it will be clearly documented, but for some projects, especially smaller ones, it might be a bit more ad hoc and informal. Governance helps outline the expectations around roles and responsibilities along with the decision-making processes so it's important to have at least the basics in place early, since it's one of those things you may think you don't need until you realize you do. 
It's usually easier to set clear expectations up front rather than realizing later that various people have very different expectations, which can take a lot more time to sort out. This doesn't mean that you need to specify everything up front, and I would discourage you from over-engineering your governance processes before you need them. A project with only a few people will not need elaborate elections to select leaders, but you should probably define a few basic roles like maintainer, define the process for contributing to your project, and talk about how decisions about those contributions are made. If the process for collaboration and decision-making are not clearly documented as part of the project governance, this can increase the risk of participating in or using the project because it introduces a lot of uncertainty into the mix. Knowing how collaboration occurs and how decisions are made is vital to being able to make contributions that are more likely to be accepted. There are a few documents that every project, even the small ones, should have. It should go without saying, but open source projects need the appropriate licensing documentation. I occasionally find repos with missing license files, but more often I see licenses not applied correctly within projects. So in addition to just checking the box to put a license file in your repository, some licenses do actually require other things like a notices file or license headers within each source file. You should also have a code of conduct that people can easily find with details about how to report incidents along with the consequences of violating the code of conduct. Now, sometimes people who are new to implementing code of conduct, codes of conduct find it intimidating because they think it's something they need to write from scratch. So don't do that. I would encourage you to use something like the contributor covenant, which is pretty much the gold standard for codes of conduct right now. And it can be simply copied and added to your repository. Now, the bit that you do need to spend some time on is making sure that you have a plan for enforcing it. You'll need to nominate a couple of people who will be responsible for taking reports of violations and handling them responsibly. The Contributor Covenant page has more details and links to resources for learning about implementing and enforcing a code of conduct. Your contribution documents should provide enough details about the contribution process so that someone new to the project can make their very first contribution. This includes details about how to sign your contributor license agreement if you have one, or how to use the developer certificate of origin or DCO process. If you have strong preferences about coding style, testing, documentation, or other requirements, this is a good opportunity to make sure that new contributors know these up front, which helps reduce the burden of trying to educate each individual contributor separately about your requirements while you're also trying to review their contributions. And you'll want to make sure that your contributors know what to expect and how to navigate the project when making contributions. The communication process should be clearly defined so that people know where and how to communicate within the project. Maybe you prefer mailing list discussions or Slack messages or issues or feature requests. And maybe you have separate communication channels for users and another one for developers. Make sure everyone understands how people within the project communicate with each other to avoid a frustrating experience, not just for new contributors, but also for your existing ones. Projects should also document the processes for reporting and responding to security issues. Projects that take a really proactive approach to addressing security issues and releasing fixes are much more likely to be secure. You could also be using some automated tools like Dependabot for example, to help identify when new versions of dependencies are available, which also helps keep on top of potential security issues. And while there are no guarantees and critical security issues can sort of pop up at any time, taking a proactive approach to security reduces the likelihood of having security issues that will be exploited later. The project should have a security.md file or another document with details about the process for reporting and responding to security concerns. At a minimum, you want to have a way for people to privately report security issues and have a few people who are designated to handle those issues. Large projects that are used by vendors within their commercial products should also have things like embargo lists where you can provide them with private information to those vendors and give them some time to prepare their security fixes for their products 
in advance of the security issue becoming public to help them avoid being exploited using your open source project when the issue does eventually become public. You should have some kind of documentation about your leadership. For small projects, you might just need a list of maintainers in your readme file, or maybe owners or maintainers files that indicate which people are responsible for the various areas within your project. Defining the roles and responsibilities for contributors, reviewers, and maintainers is probably enough as a first step, which can then help you with recruiting new people into these roles. For bigger projects, you'll want to have more details about the specific roles and responsibilities for the different leadership roles, along with how others can then move into those leadership positions. You might have committees, working groups, special interest groups, or other groups that will eventually need leaders. And again, having all of this documented helps you recruit new leaders as you try to grow the project and need more people to share in the workload. There are quite a few different options for selecting leaders as part of defining your governance. And the ideal is to have a process that provides a fair and level playing field that defines how contributors can become leaders. This should be documented so that all participants can clearly understand the criteria and process for moving both into and then out of leadership positions. Most of the bigger projects like Kubernetes have an election process, at least for the top levels of leadership like a steering committee. And at lower levels of leadership, many projects have a process where existing leaders then select new leaders. For example, new maintainers are often nominated by existing maintainers and approved after a certain number of maintainers agree, or sometimes it requires a vote by other maintainers or committee members. And there are a bunch of different options for selecting leaders. So I won't try to cover them all here, but there is an entire document devoted to these options available at the link on the bottom of the slide for more details. Your project governance should be de designed to keep diversity, equity, and inclusion top of mind. Building a diverse community where all people feel welcome and included does not just happen. It requires putting work and thought into it. And when you're starting a project and thinking about governance, this is a good time to do this. I talked about codes of conduct earlier and having a code of conduct that you actively enforce helps make sure that everyone feels safe and welcome within your community. Providing an environment where everyone, including people from marginalized populations, feel safe is the first step toward building a diverse community around your project. You should also look at whether you have a diverse set of people at every level within the project, but especially at leadership positions. And if not, come up with programs that help underrepresented folks get involved and then move up within your project. Ideally, having programs that provide people opportunities for shadowing, mentoring, and sponsoring new potential leaders can help you grow a diverse set of people into new leaders for your project. The Kubernetes Contributor Experience SIG is a great place to see an example of how to implement programs for things like shadowing and mentoring. Projects that make a concerted effort to bring in new people from a variety of backgrounds and have programs in place to then help them grow into leadership positions are more likely to benefit from increased innovation and have a healthier community. Diversity and inclusion can also be difficult to measure, and it often involves mostly a manual assessment. But we've defined some metrics within the Chaos Project's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Working Group that you should have a look at for ideas about measuring various aspects so that you can improve your project's diversity, equity, and inclusion. Governance is one of those things that is never really finished. We work in a space with constant change. The technologies change. Our strategies change. The way we work in a pandemic, for example, can completely change. Everything changes. And our governance needs to evolve right along with these changes. In particular, as open source projects become more mature and grow, what they need from governance will change dramatically. The governance processes that you need as a small project when you only have a couple of maintainers is likely to be insufficient if the project grows dramatically. So as your projects evolve, your governance should evolve right along with them. 
Now, before I wrap up the talk, let me leave you with a few resources that you might find useful. The to-do group has a bunch of guides that have great information about creating and managing healthy projects. And many of them talk about various aspects of governance. The CNCF Contributor Strategy SIG has a governance working group with more details about what you need for governance and some options for leadership selection. The Open Source Way Guidebook is a fantastic resource. It has an entire chapter on governance with loads of details. And these are all really great starting places for understanding how to govern your open source project. There are so many aspects of good governance for open source projects. And I only had time to talk in detail about a few of the ones that I think are the most important. But taking a step back and you know, looking at the big picture, what I have on this slide is the common theme that drives why I think governance as a whole is so important. Governance provides a framework for setting expectations for roles, responsibilities, how people within your project should behave. By clearly documenting these expectations, you can reduce uncertainty and make it easier for people to participate in your project. The more you can do to help everyone participate in meaningful ways, the more welcome they'll feel within your open source community. With that, I will say thank you for coming to my talk. And I think we have a little time for questions. Um, yes, thank you for that uh, wonderful talk. Um, I have a question because um, here at FOSS Backstage, we like to think of ourselves as uh, non-code contributors to open source projects um, by doing what we do. And we've um, been trying to make uh, improvements to our diversity and inclusivity. And um, I've been working on that. And one of the problems that I have struggled with is, is the metrics, is, is finding ways to, to, to measure that and to know um, the right ways to do it and um, what to be looking for and things like that. I wonder if you, if you have any uh, thoughts or tips or advice for stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. I think the so the non-code contributions are an incredibly important part of any open source project, right? So it's it's not just about writing the code. There's all this other stuff that has to happen along with it, just like you know any other project at any company. And it is it is harder to measure, um, primarily because a lot of that work actually happens outside of GitHub, which tends to be your outside of your code repository or your issues, whatever whatever you happen to use, um, which makes it a lot harder to track. Now, one of the ways that the Kubernetes project has addressed this is they really try to do most of the work through, um, through GitHub and using GitHub issues. So I was uh, one of the organizers for the contributor, um, the contributor Summit, the Kubernetes Contributor Summit. And one of the things that we did is we had, we had GitHub project boards, we had issues for each of the individual you know, elements and, you know, we would, we would comment on them, we would keep those issues updated. And we also had, you know, markdown files in the GitHub repository that had details about what we were doing to organize the contributor summit. Mm -hmm. So that gave us, you know, legitimate ways to, to kind of measure that. And then, you know, the other, I think maybe part of the other half of your question was how do you, how do you get more people um, involved? And one of the things that also within the Kubernetes community that they do is they have really good shadowing programs. Hmm. What this means is that um, when I, you know, when I'm working in the contributor uh, for the contributor summit, it's if I'm leading a section of it, I usually have a shadow who then helps me do some of the work under hmm. under my leadership, with the idea hmm. that then that shadow, if they enjoyed that experience and it was a positive one and things worked really well, that they're hmm. likely to actually lead that component in the next round. So um, so that actually works. Uh, works quite well. The Kubernetes community mm -hmm. does that around a few issues. They do it for the release team as well. So that, mm -hmm. you know, not the, it's not the same set of people who are always involved in the release, which is kind of a, it's a daunting task and it's a lot of work. And it's, you know, to do that every single, every single release is really hard. And so they mm -hmm. have this really robust shadowing program where they have okay. multiple shadows for every single role. Mm -hmm. And it's a really good way to mentor people into the community because they can, they can help out, they can see what it's like. Mm -hmm. And you know, then hopefully move into a leadership position later. Mm, great, that sounds really interesting. Um, I have a question for you from the chat. 
Um, it says, um, how can we best document ways to improve governance processes so that newcomers can truly understand the best ways to improve governance and processes too? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think I think that depends a lot on the size of the project. I think um, you know if if you're kind of a smaller project and you don't have a lot of governance documentation, I think the first step is to actually beef up the governance documentation. Um, you know, the other the other thing that you can do is you can you can have a group that's actually responsible for that. So I mean, obviously the CNCF is a you know very large organization with loads of projects. And so the, you know, we have this contributor strategy SIG within the CNCF and there's a governance working group. And so we help the CNCF come up with best practices, documentation, things like that. So you could do something similar for your project where you have a couple of people who are responsible for kind of maintaining the governance of the, the project. You know, a lot of a lot of projects, it's usually some like a steering committee or or something like that that maintains a lot of the governance documentation. Mm -hmm. So in those cases, it's a little harder to get new people um, involved. But, you know, in general, like having having working groups and, you know, special interest groups focused on things like maintaining the governance, I think is a really good idea for projects. I mean, that's one of the things I think the Kubernetes community has done a really good job of is, you know, they have all of these different working groups and special interest groups that are involved in very different things. And so it's it's easy coming into the the project to you know just find something that interests you and start start going to their meetings start you know watching watching their issues and PRs on GitHub and you can really kind of kind of see what's going on. But mm -hmm. but I do think the governance piece is a little bit harder because there are, there are definitely definitely some nuances associated with governance and it's um, it's not it's not easy to put together governance for a project. So it does it does take some work usually from you know some more experienced people once once the project gets to a certain size. But I think you know you can pull people in and 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 have them help out. Maybe maybe shadowing somebody would be a good opportunity for that as well. If you have somebody mm -hmm. already working on overhauling some of the governance, I think that might be a good opportunity to get more people involved. Mm 